I'm Brittany, this is Wei Ying, and welcome to Gay Watch, where we watch gay things, and sometimes we read them. We are making our way through the fifth and final volume of Modo Zushe. We are on page 90, we are right in the middle of unpacking all that when it comes to Jingguang Yao, and uh, I think we were actually right before kind of a mic drop moment, or we were kind of right in the middle of a mic drop moment. Listen, the entire climax of this story is one gigantic mic drop, but like specifically, uh, I think there's like something uh, um, coming up immediately that's particularly like mic droppy. Uh, so we're just going to get right into it. You probably oh the add promise of getting right into it and then not getting right into it i am so sorry um so you may have noticed that there was no moda zushi reading last week that's because on my first filming day uh the wife my wife the wife needed to go to the emergency room because of an interior problem that she was having that we needed to get taken care of. And then on my second filming day, the wife, my wife, the wife, um, stabbed herself in the hand to the point where she needed 10 stitches and immediate doctor's attention. So my wife had a week last night. And as a result, a week last night. And as a result, I had a week last week and kind of nuked the filming of this series and delayed it a week, but um, she's okay now. She's fine. She's stitched up the interior. Part. It's all, she's fine. It's okay. It's just last week was make sure that the wife is going to live to this week and she is. So we're good. Um, but that is why, that is why there was no reading last week, but there most definitely is this week. So page 90, Somewhere around the middle, yeah. And um, we're just going to go until I run out of time. So, I also kind of screwed myself because I left off in kind of a weird spot. So I'm not sure where to pick up in a way that'll, like, make sense. Although, if you're going from one video the, to the next, I suppose it doesn't matter. I've got big ADD energy going into this one. I'm so sorry. And I'm not even caffeinated yet, but I will be. So this will be fun. Where? <coughs> Asthmatic cough. We try to ignore it. When he repeated Jin Guangshan's statement word for word, everyone could picture the drunken expression on the man's face when he had first said it. Jing Guang Yao laughed. You see, Urga, I'm only worth these words as my father's son. Ha! Forget him. Lan Chi Chen looked pained. Even if your father... But you also... He couldn't think of an appropriate judgment to pass. He made as if to speak, but stopped and said instead and sighed, What is the point of saying all this now? Jing Guang Yao opened his hands and shrugged, smiling. It can't be helped. Wanting others to pity me, even when I've committed every crime in the world, that's the kind of person I am. Even amidst unpacking all of this, we don't have time to unpack all that. At the word person, he suddenly flipped his wrist and wound a red guchin string around Jin Ling's neck. The corners of Jin Guangyao's eyes still had tears in them as he ordered in a dark voice, Don't move. This time, they were truly caught off guard. Wei Wuxian, Jing Chung bellowed. Didn't you already disarm him? In his moment of desperation, he'd actually shouted to Wei Wuxian in a tone that was exactly the same as the one he'd used as a boy. Why you gotta come out here with rudeness? We're just trying to have a... I don't like her. Am I about to sneeze? No. I definitely took away all his Guchin strings, Wei Wuxian shouted back. Jing Guangyao's cultivation couldn't possibly be high enough to conjure items out of thin air. But Lan Wangji figured it out with a single glance. He hid it inside his body. I love this part. This part makes me really comfortable. At his prompting, the others looked closer. 
On one side of Jin Guangyao's abdomen, a patch of red was gradually spreading across his white garments. The guqin string was red because it was soaked in blood. Of course, Wei Wuxian hadn't found it earlier. Jin Guangyao hasn't hidden it on him, but inside him. He had bided his time with conversation until the opportunity was ripe. When Lan Shi Chen was suitably worked up and everyone's attention was diverted, he provoked Jin Ling into charging him. Seizing the chance, he sliced his abdomen with his finger and, and dug the string from his body. Who could have imagined Jin Guangyao would do such a thing to himself just to have one more trick up his sleeve? Me. I'm people. I'm who. I'm who could have imagined. He is absolutely that bitch. He is that Amy Dunn type of psycho where he is capable of physically hurting himself for to meet his own ends, to meet his own like agenda, to help himself out. He is absolutely that kind of psychotic bitch. While the Guqin string was extremely, extremely fine, it was still a metallic foreign object buried in his flesh, constantly shifting with his every movement. The sensation could hardly have been pleasant. Ah Ling, cried Zheng Cheng, aghast. The shout made Wei Wuxian move unconsciously, but someone immediately grabbed him. When he looked back and saw it was Lan Wangji, he managed with some difficulty to compose himself and not lose his head. Jin Guangyao rose to his feet, continuing to restrain Jin Ling. Sek Leader Jiang, no need to get so worked up. I have also watched Ah Ling grow up after all. I'll say it again. Let us each go our own separate ways. Naturally, Ah Ling will return to you unharmed after some time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We're big in the mood to believe you right now. Anything that comes out of your mouth, sure. <clears throat> ah Ling, don't move, Jing Chen cried. Jing Guangyao, take me instead if you insist on a hostage. It's all the same. It's very much not the same, Jing Guangyao replied frankly. Sec Leader Jiang, you're injured and have difficulty moving. You'll only hold me back. Wei Wuxian's palms began to sweat. Sec Leader Jin, did you forget something? Your loyal subordinate is still here. Bold of you to assume he gives a shit about that monkey. Jing Guangyao looked at Su She, who was being held hostage at sword point by Lan Wangji. With some difficulty, Su She immediately shouted in a hoarse voice, Sec Leader, no need to bother with me. Thank you, Jing Guangyao answered with equal speed. Slowly, Lan Shi Chen stated, Sec Leader Jin, you have lied once again. Just this once, Jing Guangyao replied. It will not happen again. This is what you said last time, Lan Shi Chen said. I can no longer tell which of your words are genuine. And dear fucking God, if this moment in the show wasn't... Why? Why did they do this to my husband? Actually, I could take about an hour explaining all of the narrative and thematic reasons as to why exactly this is happening to Lan Chi Chen, but that's beside the point, okay? My husband is in pain. Jing Guangyao was about to speak when an unprecedentedly... Ooh. Unprecedentedly? That's a word, sure. Loud clap of thunder crashed through the air. Though far away, it sounded strangely close. He shuddered unconsciously and swallowed any further comments. Three odd, loud sounds followed shortly after, coming from outside the temple. The sound was less a knock on the door and more a slam. It didn't sound like the pounding of a human fist so much as it did someone violently smashing a man's head against the wood over and over again. Each bang was louder than the last, and the crack in the bolt holding the door, gr holding the door closed grew increasingly larger. Jin Guangyao's expression was also growing more and more twisted by the second. By the fourth slam, the bolt finally snapped. Heavy rain and a dark figure swirled in unison, crashing through the door. Jin Guangyao jolted. He seemed to consider dodging, but very quickly suppressed the urge. The figure that flew in was not heading in his direction, but rather Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangji's. Moving with no particular hurry, both of them parted for a split second before coming back together in no time, standing shoulder to shoulder like it was the most natural thing in the world. Oh my god, they are totally that fucking couple. They take forever to get together, 
for a variety of reasons. But then once they are, they are the disgustingly inseparable PDA having just unabashedly. They are those bitches, and I love that for them. Wei Bushan looked back. Wen Ning. Wen Ning crashed into the temple's Guan Yin statue. He hung there for a moment with his head down and feet up before falling to the ground with a thud. Only then did he greet Wei Wushan. Gongji. Zheng Cheng's and Jin Ling's expressions grew somewhat upset at the sight of him. On the other hand, Ni Huasong shouted, Daga! Wen Ning's dynamic entrance aside, there was another figure standing at the temple doors. His silhouette was taller, sturdier, chiseled, and solid, and his steely face had an ashen complexion. He stared at them with dull, lifeless eyes. It was none other than Shi Feng Jun. Ni Mingzhu. He stood before the Guanyin Temple in the torrential rain like an iron pagoda obstructing everyone's path. His head sat squarely in place, and dense black stitches could be seen around his neck. Someone had sewn his head back onto his body with a single thread. Daga, Lan Shi Chen called out. Ha, <laughs> Daga! Jin Guangyao murmured as well. There were three people in the temple who called out to Ni Mingzhu's corpse with the address Daga, but each of their tones were poles apart. Jin Guangyao's face was awash with overwhelming fear, and his entire body started to shiver. In life or in death, his sworn brother was undoubtedly the one Jin Guangyao feared the most, thanks to his violent temper and unyielding character. The moment his body began to shake, so did his hand and with his hand the bloody Kuchin string he clutched began to quiver as well. Suddenly, Lan Wangji drew Bi Chen and slashed down. In the blink of an eye, he dashed over to Jin Ling and caught hold of something. Jin Guangyao's arm felt oddly light. Slightly stunned, he looked down, only to realize that his right hand was gone, cleanly cut off at the forearm. What Lang Wangxi had caught was the severed hand, still gripping the lethal Guchin string. Just a man, a myth, an icon, a legend, a lifestyle. Bye! <sighs> Blood erupted everywhere in an instant. Jing Yao's face went ghastly pale with pain. He didn't even have the strength to scream, to scream, but only staggered back a few steps. Unable to remain steady on his feet, he fell to the ground. In his stead, it was Su She who started to scream. There was a split second when Lan Chi Chen looked like he wanted to go over and support Jin Guang Yao, but in the end, he didn't dare move. You know, it hurts just as much reading it as it does watching it. Lan Wangji pried open the fingers of the severed fist, releasing the Guchin string and finally freeing Jin Ling from danger. Zheng Cheng was just about to lunge over to see if he was injured, but Wei Wushan beat him to it. He grabbed Jin Ling's shoulders and examined him carefully. Only when he confirmed that the skin on Jin Ling's neck was undamaged, without so much as a scratch, did he heave a sigh of relief. Lan Wangji always let himself room always left himself room to change tack whenever he struck with his sword. But this had been a dire situation. The Guchin string was extremely sharp. In the hands of someone versed in the art of the killing cord, it could slice through flesh and bones like melons and vegetables. All it would take for Jing Wang Yao's hand to start trembling, for him to jerk one more time, or worse yet, forget he had someone in his clutches and make a run for it while still holding the Guchin string. If Lan Wangji had not acted with decisive speed and precision to sever the hand holding the string, Jin Ling may well have been decapitated by now his blood spewing meters into the air. The spray of blood from Jing Guangyao's severed arm hit Jin Ling dead on, staining most of his body and part of his face with blood. He was still in a daze, yet to grasp just what had happened. Wei Wuxian gave him a fierce hug. Stay far away from such dangerous characters next time. What were you thinking standing so close earlier, brat? He scolded. If Zhang Yunli and Jin Zixuan's only son perished before his eyes, he really wouldn't know what to do. You know, I knew that intuitively, and then you had to go and explicitly state it like that? Um, 
God. Just perpetual rudeness from her. Jinling wasn't accustomed to being hugged like this. All at once, a blush blossomed on his pale face. He vigorously pushed at Wei Wuxian's chest, but was caught, caught fast. Wei Wuxian hugged him a few more times with greater ferocity before patting him heavily on the shoulder and shoving him over to Jiang Chung. Go, stop running around and go over to your uncle. Jiang Chun caught the still dizzy and disoriented Jin Ling and looked at Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangji as they stood together. After a moment of hesitation, he uttered a quiet thank you to Lan Wangji. Although his voice was quiet, his words were not at all ambiguous. Thank you, Hang Wing Jun, for saving my life, said Jin Ling as well. Lan Wangji nodded and said nothing. Bi Chen was angled toward the ground and the drops of blood slid swiftly off the bright, clear blade, leaving not a stain behind. He turned to aim the sword at Ni Ming Zhu, who was still standing at the entrance. Wen Ning slowly climbed to his feet and popped his broken arm back into place. Be careful, his resentful energy should not be underestimated. Jing Guangyao gritted his teeth and tapped a few acupoints on his severed arm. He had lost too much blood and was feeling dizzy. All of a sudden, he saw Ni Ming Zhu take a step in his direction, eyes trained on him, and promptly lost his mind from terror. Su She coughed up another mouthful of blood and bellowed at the top of his lungs, Fools! What are you people standing around for? Stop him! Stop that creature at the entrance! Only then did the dumbstruck Jing Clan cultivators move to surround him, their blades drawn. The two in the lead were instantly sent flying by a strike from Ni Ming Zhu's palm. Using his left hand, Jing Guang Yao sprinkled medicinal powder over his severed arm, but it was immediately flushed away by the flowing blood. He all but had tears in his eyes as he tore at the front flap of his robe, trying to find a way to bandage his arm and stop the bleeding. However, his left hand had been burned by the corrosive smoke inside the coffin and black chest earlier. It trembled as he attempted to rip a strip from his clothing, leaving him unable to exert any force. It was a futile effort and only added to his pain. Scrambling to his feet, Su Shi lunged, lunged over and tore off his own white robe to bandage Jing Wang Yao's arm for him. Su Shi patted himself down for any extra medicinal ointment or powder, but came up empty-handed. As it happened, Lan Shi Chen was shielding Ni Hua Song as he helped him retreat to a safe spot nearby, so Su Shi turned to him. Sec Leader Lan, Sec Leader Lan, do you have any remedies? He pleaded. Please help. Sec Leader Jin has always treated you with courtesy. Consider it a favor. Oh my god. You know who Sushi reminds me of? Like, just role-wise, place in the narrative-wise? He is giving, um, um, Tawan from Kim Porsche. Right? Right? Whoa. Jing Guangyao was a wretched sight to behold, on the verge of passing out. Lan Shichen clearly didn't have the heart to see him in such a state. But just then, there was a series of blood-curdling screams. Ni Mingzhu struck out hard with a heavy fist, and in one single strike, smashed three of the Jin cultivators, cultivators, cultivators into a bloody mass of flesh. Get you a man. A live man. But get you a man. Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangji stood before Jiang Chang and Jin Ling, shielding them. <coughs> <coughs> Wen Ning, how did you run into him? Wei Wuxian called out. After popping his arm into place, Wen Ning did the same to his leg. I'm sorry, Gongji, he said. You told me to look for Lan Gongji. I couldn't find him at the inn, so I went searching for him outside. Before I could chance upon Lan Gongji, I saw Chu Feng Jun walking down the street. A group of beggars went to pester him when they saw him, not knowing how dangerous he was. Zhu Feng Jun had no con has no conscious mind. He nearly tore them apart with his bare hands. All I could do was fight him the entire way here. There was no need for Wei Wuxian to ask why Wen Ning hadn't found Lan Wangji at the inn. He hadn't been able to fall asleep with Lan Wangji next door. How, likewise, could Lan Wangji have fallen asleep with him next door? Oh, now we have all the confidence in the world. Now that we know, we know. Like a fucking light switch. Like, now it's like, oh, okay, you're 
as in love with me as I am with you, we've confirmed all these feelings. And also now I know exactly the lengths that you went to for me. So like, of course, if I can't sleep without you, you can't sleep without me. Oh my God. This is like, they are really you hauling it on the first date. It's so delightfully and heartwarmingly lesbian of them. I can't, uh, uh, sorry. I just totally lost my place as a result of the fathoming. He must have also stepped out to wander around and then run into Fairy, who had retreated with its tail between its legs to call for reinforcements. The sudden thunderstorm must have started after Wen Ning and Ning Ming Zhu began fighting. Corpses naturally attracted the dark and the nefarious, and that effect would only be compounded with two extraordinary fierce corpses in one place. Although the cultivators from the Jin clan of Lenling Ling were no match for Niming Zhu, they kept bravely charging forward. But when their swords came down on Niming Zhu's body, it was like they were trying to slice through the finest steel. They could not inflict even a single gash upon him. Ni Huasong peeked out from behind Lan Chi Chen. D dog it, uh, I'm, he said, both terrified and hopeful. Naming Zhu's blank white eyes bulged with fury. He suddenly made a grab for Ni Huasong, but Lan Shi Chen dipped his head, and Lai Bing let out a mournful moan. Naming Zhu froze. Daga, Lan Shi Chen said, this is Huasong. Daga doesn't even recognize me anymore, Ni Huasong lamented. That hurt. You see what I mean by the casual drive by just stabbing in the fucking face god it's not just you he doesn't recognize he doesn't even know who he is now Wei Wushan said Ni Ming Zhu was a walking corpse driven by overwhelming resentment he was oh I can never remember how to pronounce this word it's either irascible or erasable probably irascible to distinguish itself from the word erasable but the word i'm talking about is i r a s c i b l e and i can just never fucking remember that word you know he was irascible and violent and he attacked everyone regardless of who they were wen ning took a moment to recover before stepping forward to get involved in the fight once more but wen ning's resentful energy was not as intense as naming Zhu's and his physique was not as tall or strapping. In addition, Wei Wuxian's flute had been smashed. With him unable to provide any support, Wen Ning was at a slight disadvantage. Jin Guangyao, who was lying on the ground, finally managed with some difficulty to staunch the bleeding from his arm. Su Xie climbed to his feet and lifted Jin Guangyao onto his back, seeking to escape during the mayhem, but the movement drew Ni Ming Zhu's attention to them again. He flung Wen Ning off of him and stormed over to Jin Guang Yao with large strides. Xiao Shu, run! cried Jin Ling in spite of himself. Seeing him actually warn the enemy, Jane Chung smacked him on the back of the head. Shut up! he barked angrily. The smack brought Jin Ling back to his senses. Still, this was his little uncle, who had watched him grow up. Not once in the past decade had Jin Guang Yao ever been unkind to him. When he'd seen his little uncle about to meet a horrible end at the hands of the fierce corpse, he hadn't been able to keep from blurting out a warning in haste. When Ni Ming Zhu heard Jin Ling shout, he turned his head with some measure of uncertainty. Wei Wuxian's heart clenched. Oh no, he muttered under his breath. Now that Ni Ming Zhu had become a fierce corpse, most of his resentment was naturally reserved for his foe, Jin Guang Yao. But fierce corpses did not distinguish between people using their eyes. Jin Guang Yao and Jin Ling were closely related by blood. To a malevolent creature of the dead, these two living beings were similar in blood and vital breath. To a creature of the darkness in a state of chaotic confusion, it was even harder to tell them apart. Blood was pouring from Jin Guangyao's severed arm. His breathing was weak and he was practically half dead. Jin Ling, on the other hand, was still full of life and vigor. Ni Ming Zhu's dead, unthinking brain naturally gravitated more toward Jin Ling. Lan Wangji unsheathed Bi Chen and struck Ni Ming Zhu squarely in the chest. As expected, the tip of the sword was halted as soon as it struck him. When Ni Ming Zhu looked down and saw the long, gleaming sword, he howled and reached for it. 
Lan Wangji immediately called Bi Chen back. It returned to its sheath with a shing, and Ni Mingzhu caught only empty air. Immediately after, Lan Wangji flipped, flipped his left hand to bring out his guchin. Wangji, right, his guchin Wangji. Without wasting any time, he held it in his palm and strummed a few clear and far-reaching notes. Lan Shi Chen also brought Lai Bing to his lips once more. For his part, Wei Wuxian brandished over fifty talismans and flung them at Ni Mingzhu. But before the talismans could get close to him, they were set ablaze by his resentful energy and burned to ash in midair. Ni Mingzhu let loose an enraged roar and made a grab for Jin Ling. Jing Chung and Jin Ling had already retreated to a corner of the room with nowhere left to run. Jing Chung had to push Jin Ling behind him as he drew Sandu, which was temporarily unable to use spiritual energy, and braced himself to meet the attack head on. Both Ku Chin and Xiao were already playing in unison, but it seemed they were not enough. Ni Ming Zhu's strong fist punched through flesh. But this flesh was not Jing Chung's, nor was it Jin Ling's. Wen Ning stood in front of them, shielding them. He grabbed Ni Ming Zhu's steel like arm with both hands and slowly pulled it out of his chest, leaving a massive hole behind that one could see straight through. Though he did not bleed, some black chunks of viscera fell out of him. There's a detail. I did not need MXTX. Also, how much are you going to put my boy through, huh? How much? Exactly how much. I don't want to know, but I demand to know. You know what I mean? Wen Ning, Wei Wusheng cried out. Jing Chung, on the other hand, looked like he might go mad right then and there. You, you, he spluttered. The force of the punch was so powerful that it hadn't just pierced Wen Ning's chest, but also shattered part of his vocal cords. He couldn't even say a word before he toppled over, and he just so happened to fall directly on Jing Chung and Jin Ling. His body was temporarily immobile, but his eyes were still wide open as he stared unblinkingly at both of them. Jin Ling had initially abhorred this murderer, this walking weapon that had driven a palm through his father's chest. Ever since he was a child, he'd sworn countless times that he'd cut Wei Ying and Wen Ning to a million pieces if he ever had the chance, one slice at a time. Later, he found he didn't want to hate Wei Wuxian, so he doubled his efforts to hate Wen Ning instead. But as he stared at this murderer, this weapon, who was sprawled before them with his chest similarly punched through, he couldn't even bring himself to shove Wending away so that he wasn't leaning on them. He knew full well that Wending was a dead man. He would probably be fine if he was cut in half at the waist. Having a hole punched through his chest was nothing. But for some reason he couldn't understand... Tears just kept flowing uncontrollably from his eyes. With that single punch, Ni Mingzhu's movements came to a standstill as well. Lan Wangji and Lan Chen played their instruments in unison, with the Guchin flowing like an icy spring and the Xiao howling like forbidding winds. That's a sentence. The sounds they made were all ones that Ni Mingzhu loathed, and the shrillness of the duet only increased exponentially. The music made him sluggish, as if someone had bound him from head to toe with an invisible rope, until he finally went berserk and forcibly broke the shack. Ooh, 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 sorry. As the rope tightened around him, so too did his rage increase, until he finally went berserk and forcibly broke the shackles of the eradication tone. He struck out at the one playing the guchin. Lan Wangji calmly spun to sidestep his, his, his <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Lan Wangji calmly spun to sidestep his attack. The sound of his guchin did not stall for even a moment. Ni Mingzhu's blow broke through the wall. He was just about to turn around when he suddenly heard two sprightly chirps. Withdrawing his fist from the wall, he looked in the direction of the sound instead. Wei Wuxian whistled twice more and greeted him with a smile. Hello, Chifeng Jun. Recognize me? Ni Mingzhu's hideous white eyes locked on him. It's fine if you don't, he continued, as long as you recognize this whistle. That's the end of the chapter. We are then starting chapter 22, which is called Hidden Edge. I wonder if that has the double, potentially triple meaning that I think it does. It might. 
Lan Shi Chen removed Lai Bing from his lips. Wei Gong Ji! He had intended to remind Wei Wuxian that his current body belonged to Mo Xuan Yu, who was also related by blood to Jin Guangyao, and more closely than the latter was to Jin Ling. Things would only grow more fraught if Ni Ming Zhu identified him as a target for his vengeance. But before Lan Shi Chen could say another word, Lan Wang Ji turned to him and shook his head, looking both calm and composed. Lan Shi Chen immediately understood what he meant. There was no need to worry. Lan Wang Ji believed Wei Wu Shen would be fine. Okay. Wei Wu Shen whistled an easy tune, complimenting his easy stride. The whistling was calming to the ear, but the idyllic melody sounded eerie against the backdrop of a Guanyin temple littered with bodies in the middle of a raging storm. Wen Ning remained sprawled on Zhang Cheng and Jin Ling, but when he heard the song, an unusually powerful urge seemed to drive him seemed to drive him to stand. He struggled a moment, then fell over again, perhaps because he'd managed to resist the compulsion, or because he hadn't yet regained his ability to move. Zhang Cheng and Jin Ling both unconsciously reached out to catch him, but they looked conflicted about it, as though they also wanted to drop him immediately. Grinning, Wei Wuxian continued to whistle what sounded like a whimsical tune. He backed away at an unhurried pace, hands clasped behind his back. Ni Ming Zhu remained where he was. He seemed indifferent when Wei Wuxian took his first step back, and even the third did not move him. But by the seventh, it seemed he could no longer withstand the power of that compulsion, and took a step in the direction Wei Wuxian was heading, which was toward the magnificent empty coffin in the temple's rear grounds. As long as Ni Ming Zhu went in there, Wei Wuxian had a way of sealing him away. The curse of white smoke had long since dispersed and was no longer a threat. Ni Ming Zhu's expression was dark and steely as he was guided to the empty coffin, which seemed to instinctively repulse him. Everyone, especially Lan Wangji, watched with bated breath as Wei Wuxian circled around the coffin. As he continued to whistle leisurely, Wei Wuxian tossed a look Lan Wangji's way. When their eyes met, he gave Lan Wangji a flirtatious wink. Wuxian, you're in the middle of... Why, why would I expect any fucking thing less? <sighs> a... A barely perceptible quiver rippled through the Guqin music flowing from Lan Wangji's fingers, as if they'd been pricked by a small needle of sweetness. But the vacillation was instantly calmed. Wei Wuxian, feeling a bit smug, turned his head back to Ni Ming Zhu and patted the rim of the coffin. Feeling a little smug myself. Finally, moving at a painfully slow pace, Ni Ming Zhu leaned down, but just as he was about to lay half his body into the coffin, there came a sudden horrid cry from behind Lan Shi Chen. Ni Ming Zhu stopped mid action and whipped his head around, as did everyone else. They saw Su She with Jing Guang Yao on his back, one of his hands supporting Jing Guang Yao's thigh, and the other gripping a sword that dripped with blood. Li Huasong lay collapsed on the floor clutching his leg and rolling around in pain. At the sight of this, Lan Shi Chen used Shoye's, uh, Shoye's sword Qi to strike the hand with which Su She held his blade, leaving him stunned as the hilt slipped free of his grip. Ni Huasang had already been wounded and the air was tinged with the scent of blood. Ruining my work at such a critical moment. Outrageous, Wei Wuxian berated him in his head. You're the one over here winking at your boyfriend and treating this all casually. But, you know, someone gets physically wounded and it's like, God, the interruptions. Can they take this seriously? <coughs> Ni Huasong and Ni Mingzhu were half-brothers, born of different mothers but sharing the same father. 
The smell of Niu Huasong's blood wouldn't rouse Niu Mingzhu's murderous intent, but it would rouse his curiosity. That curiosity would lure him into renewed proximity to Jing Guangyao, who would then regain his attention. If Jing Guangyao was killed, Niu Mingzhu's ferocity would no doubt escalate and thus make him all the harder to subdue. Sure enough, Niu Mingzhu growled as he moved away from the coffin. He instantly recognized who lay on Su Xie's back, and not even Wei Wuxian's whistling could restrain him any longer. Ni Mingzhu hurtled over like a blast of wind, his grasping, ooh, his grasping hand aiming for Jing Guangyao's head. Su Xie swiftly sidestepped. With the tip of his foot, he kicked up the longsword that had previously been struck out of his hand and gathered every last bit of spiritual power he had to aim the blade at Ni Mingzhu's heart. Perhaps because it was a matter of life or death, the attack was miraculously fast and fierce. The sword was filled to the brim with his spiritual power, glowing with a stunning brilliance that put all his previous attacks to shame. Beautiful, said Wei Wuxian, unable to resist praising it. The explosive attack forced Ning Mingzhu to take a single large step back. But as soon as the spiritual light dimmed, he moved forward once more, relentlessly grabbing at Jing Yao. Su Xie flung Jing Wang out to Lan Shi Chen with one hand while he slashed at Ni Ming Zhu's throat. Even though Ni Ming Zhu's body was as impenetrable as iron, the thread sewn around his neck might not be. Had the attack landed, it might have at least bought them some, bought them some time, even if it couldn't subdue Ni Ming Zhu. But the sword had just been infused with a sudden burst of spiritual power that was well beyond its capacity. Without warning, it shattered into pieces mid-swing. As for Ni Mingzhu's strike, it landed squarely on Su Xie's chest. Oh no! Jing Guangyao, lying next to Lan Shi Chen in a heap, also witnessed this. A hint of tears glistened in his eyes, perhaps because of the immense pain and blood loss from his midriff and severed hand. There was no time for him to catch his breath or lick his wounds, however. Once Ni Mingzhu withdrew his hand, he turned around and stared predatorily in Jing Guangyao's direction once more. The set jaw, the aloof, stern, and critical way he looked at him. It was exactly the same as when he was alive. It was the gaze that Jing Guangyao feared the most. Jing Guangyao's tears ran dry due to sheer terror. Erga, he pleaded in a quivering voice. Lan Chen shifted the course of his sword, and Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangji also hastily changed their tune. But the whistling's control had already been broken previously, and renewing the effect using the same method would be much harder. Wei Wuxian, someone called suddenly. What? Wei Wuxian answered immediately, realizing only after the fact that it was Jiang Chung who'd spoken. He found the latter calling him a bit odd, but Jiang Chung didn't say another word. Instead, he retrieved something from his sleeve and hurled the item at Wei Wuxian, who caught it without a second thought. When he looked down, he saw that it was a shining black flute with a bright red tassel. Fastened at the end. The Hell Flute Chen Ching. <sighs> With that very familiar flute in his hand, Wei Wuxian abandoned his surprised expression, along with everything else. He raised it to his lips without hesitation. Lan Zhen, he called. Lan Wangji gave a slight nod. Nothing else needed to be said. You go ahead, Boo. You go ahead. You go ahead, you use your demonic magic. I know that you'll be fine. I trust in your capacity. I'm not going to make the same mistake again. I believe in you, baby. I'll hold your flower. Go kick their ass. All communicated with a slight nod. Mind you. <sighs> Guchin and Flute began their duet. Icy spring water was the Guchin, and the flute was like a bird in flight. One suppressed while the other lured. Under their combi- No, even worse, let me help you do your demonic bo- <sighs> Under their combined efforts. Oh, one suppressed while the other lured. Under their combined efforts, Ni Mingzhu's body swayed before he was finally half-forced to move away from Jing Guangyao. Under the duet's thrall, he moved swiftly toward the empty coffin once more, step by step. Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangzhi followed him closely, step by step. As he leapt into the casket, the two each kicked one end of the coffin, oh, coffin cover at the same time. The hefty lid flew upward, then dropped into place. Moving fast, Wei Wuxian hopped agilely onto the head of the coffin, 
stuck Ten Ching back into his waistband and bit a finger on his right hand. Movements flowing like water, he drew the vibrant, bloody lines of his spell without a moment's faltering. Only then did the beasty, beastly howling within the coffin gradually subside. Lan Wangji pressed down on his Guchen's seven vibrating strings, halting the song flowing from his fingertips. Wei Wuxian softly blew out a long breath. He prudently waited to see if he could sense anything, and only stood up after ensuring there was no more power to be felt from beneath the lid. Oh! Yeah, 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 yeah. We have, we have art, we have art of the boyfriends on their hot boy shit. Mm-hmm. Look at that. Look, that's beautiful. With the black flowing robe and with the white. Oh. That's beautiful. Why are they so beautiful? God. <sighs> what a bad temper, no? Standing on top of the coffin, he was much taller than Lan Wangji. Lan Wangji put away his guchin and raised his head to look at him with his light eyes. Wei Wuxian leaned down, unable to resist, giving that pristine face a little scratch. Maybe by accident or maybe on purpose, his fingers left a few bloody red streaks in their wake. Lan Wangji didn't mind in the least. Come down now. Wei Wuxian jumped, smiling, and he caught him perfectly. He caught him perfectly. He caught him perfectly. Things were quieting down, but Ni Huasong started crying in pain at the other end of the room. Shi Chenga, he cried. Quickly, come help see if my leg's still connected to my body. Lan Shi Chen walked over and held him down. After his examination, he comforted him. Huasong, you are fine. No need to be so scared. Your leg is not broken. It was merely stabbed. Ni Huasong was horrified. Stabbed? How could I not be scared if I was stabbed? Was it pierced through? Shi Chenga, help me! Lan Shi Chen was torn between laughing and crying. Hey! Close enough! Take a shot! The heaven official blessing people know what I'm talking about. It is not that serious. But Ni Huasong continued to whirl around on the ground, hugging his leg. Knowing Ni Huasong was terrified of pain, Lan Shi Chen retrieved a pill bottle from his breast pocket and placed it in his hands. To soothe your discomfort. Ni Huasong immediately took out a pill and swallowed it. Why am I so unlucky? Getting randomly captured by Su Min Shen on the road, he started out just trying to make a break for it moments ago too, but then turned around and stabbed me. If I was in his way, he could have just pushed me aside. Why use a weapon? Lan Shi Chen straightened up and looked back. Jing Guan Yao was in an extremely sorry state, still sitting where he had fallen. His face was white as a sheet, his hair was slightly mussed, and cold sweat drenched his forehead. Perhaps because the pain of his severed hand was too great, he was unable to contain the soft groan that escaped his lips. He looked up to meet Lan Shi Chen's eyes. Although nothing was said, the sight he presented alone, protecting the stump that was now his wrist, wearing a most miserable expression, made it difficult not to feel sympathy. Lan Shi Chen gazed at him for a bit, then sighed. In the end, he took out the medicinal remedies he carried on him. Sec Leader, Sec Leader Lan, Wei, Wei <laughs> I got a lot of thoughts going on. Sec Leader Lan, Wei Wuxian cautioned. Wei Guangxi, he cannot do anything right now, considering the state he is in, Lan Shi Chen said. He might die here and now if we do not attend to him. There are still many things that remain unclear and will require further questioning. I understand, Sec Leader Lan, Wei Wuxian said. I'm not telling you not to save him. I'm just cautioning you to be careful. Best to cast the silence spell to keep him from speaking. Lan Shi Chen gave a light nod and turned to Jin Guang Yao. As you hear, Sec Leader Jin, please do not do anything unnecessary. In the event you make any sort of move, I will show no mercy. He took a deep breath in taking your life. Jing Wang Yao nodded and said in a weak, quiet voice, Thank you, Zewujun. 
Lan Chen bent down and began to minister to Jing Guanyao's wrist with both care and caution as the latter shivered. Seeing the state his once infinitely glorious sworn brother had been reduced to, Lan Chen didn't know what to say. All he could do was sigh to himself. Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangji went together to the corner where Wen Ning still lay awkwardly half-collapsed over Zheng Cheng and Jin Ling. Wei Wuxian laid him flat on the floor and inspected the hole in his chest. Look at this. What am I going to fill this with? He griped, greatly chagrined. Greatly chagrined. Gongji, is my condition serious? Wen Ning asked. No, Wei Wuxian replied. It's not like you need organs, but it's ugly. I don't need to look pretty, though. Jing Cheng was silent, and when Jin Ling looked like he was holding... While Jin Ling looked like he was holding back what he wanted to say. At the other end of the room... Lan Chen had wanted to take this chance to issue a proper reprimand. Seeing Jing Guang Ya <laughs> So every sentence is fucking me up! And that just makes me fuck up the sentence! Damn it. Seeing Jing Guang Yao on the verge of fainting from the pain of the treatment, however, he was unable to bear the sight. He turned his head to make a request of Ni Huasong. Huasong, pass me the bottle from earlier. Ni Huasong had tucked the pill bottle into his breast pocket after taking a few painkillers earlier. Oh, okay, he replied quickly. He began to rummage through his robes, trying to find the bottle for Lan Chi Chen. All of a sudden, his pupils contracted, and he cried out, voice aghast, Shichenga, watch out behind you! Lan Chi Chen had never let down his guard around Jing Wang Yao. He was tense as a taut string, and Ni Hua Song's expression, coupled with his cry, made his heart drop. He drew his sword without a second thought and stabbed behind him. His blade pierced Jing Wang Yao's chest. Shock and dismay were written on Jing Wang Yao's face as his heart was run through. Oh God, did we have to get out of this? <sighs> the others were just as shocked by this sudden turn of events. Wei Wuxian shot to his feet. What happened? Ni Huasong stammered as he tried to explain himself. Uh, I saw Senga, no, I saw Sec Leader Jin reach behind his back, and I didn't know if he was going to. Jing Wang Yao looked down at the sword that had penetrated him. His lips quivered. He clearly wanted to speak, but thanks to the silence spell, there was nothing he could say in his own defense. Wei Wuxian noticed something was off, but before he could raise any questions, Jing Guang Yao coughed up a large mouthful of blood. Lan Shi Chen, he cried in a raspy voice. Surprisingly, he had managed to break the silent spell by force. Jing Guang Yao was covered in injuries. His left hand had been burnt by the corrosive smoke, his right hand had been severed, and he was missing a chunk of his midriff. He was stained in blood from head to toe. Though he could barely sit up, he somehow managed to get to his feet, perhaps thanks to a sudden burst of his remaining strength. Lan Shi Chen, he cried again, voice full of hate. Lan Shi Chen looked both disappointed and despondent in equally severe measure. Sec Leader Jin, I said that I would not show mercy if you made another move. Jing Guangyao scoffed brutally, then rebutted, Yes, you said just that. But did I do anything at all? He had always been gentle and graceful in front of others, but now wore a vulgar, savage face more suited to the streets. At the sight of this complete reversal, Lan Chi Chen also sensed something was wrong. He immediately turned to look at Ni Hua Song. Hang on, we have this great, lovely, beautiful, fantastic art of one boyfriend running his sword through another one hit through it through the other there we go and not in a pleasant double entendre kind of way jing guang yao burst out laughing enough why bother even looking at him what could you possibly detect even i didn't notice anything after all these years Good one, Huasong. Mi Huasong's mouth gaped open as if he'd been scared mute by the sudden accusation. To think I'd fall like this, by your hand, Jing Wenyao spat hatefully. He forced himself to remain upright. He clearly wanted to talk o wanted to walk over to Mi Huasong, 
but there was still a sword piercing his heart. He took a single step and immediately grimaced in pain. Unable to either deal him <clears throat> unable to either deal him a finishing blow or recklessly pull the blade free, Lan Shi Jen could only blurt Don't move Jing Guang Yao couldn't move another step regardless. He gripped the hilt of the blade protruding from his chest and remained where he stood. After coughing out another mouthful of blood, he began to speak. Head shaker indeed. No wonder. Excellent work concealing yourself for so many years. Mi Huisong pleaded in a shuddering voice. Shi Chenga, you have to believe me. I really did see him. You, snarled Jin Guangya with, with a scowl. He lunged forward in an attempt to tackle Ni Huisong, and the sword pushed another inch into his chest. Do not move, Lan Shi Chen shouted. He'd suffered so many losses at Jin Guangyao's hands, fallen for so many of his lies. He couldn't help but remain vigilant. Afraid Jing Guangyao was attempting to distract him in a moment of desperation, going on the attack simply because Ni Huasong had exposed what he was about to do behind Lan Shi Chen's back. Jing Guangyao understood the look in his eyes and laughed with sheer anger. Lan Shi Chen, all my life I've lied to countless people and I've harmed countless others. It's just like you said. I killed my father, killed my brothers, killed my wife, killed my son, killed my teachers, killed my friends. I've committed every crime there is. He inhaled deeply, then rasped out, but never have I ever wanted to hurt you. Lan Shi Chen was stunned. <sighs> Panting, Jing Guanyao gripped the hilt of Lan Shi Chen's sword and clenched his teeth. Who saved you from disaster back when the cloud recesses burned to the ground and you were on the run? And who put forth the utmost effort to provide assistance when the land clan of Gusu was rebuilding their home? In all these years, have I ever wronged the land clan? Was there ever an occasion when I didn't support you in every way? Aside from temporarily sealing your spiritual powers tonight, when have I ever done wrong by you or your clan? When have I ever demanded you repay your debt? His questions left Lan Shi Chen unable to bring himself to cast the silence spell again, and so Jing Guangyao continued. Suman Shen went this far to repay my kindness simply because I remembered his name. But you, Zibujun, sect leader Lan, just like Ni Mingzhu, you cannot tolerate me. You won't even give me a way to live. This is the crux of it right here. This is, um, this is what makes all of this so deeply fucked up this page 115 115 is where we really understand how fucked up the uh jing wang yao and lan shi chen dynamic is so much so that i lose my place When he was done speaking, Jing Guangyao abruptly backed away, forcibly drawing Shuye from his chest. Don't let him get away, Jing Cheng shouted. Lan Shi Chen rushed forward, effortlessly seizing him again in a few steps. Jing Guangyao couldn't have gotten far in the state he was in, no matter how fast he ran. Even Jin Ling could have caught him with his eyes closed. He was wounded in numerous places and had been dealt a fatal strike to the heart. There was no need for them to take precautions. It suddenly hit Wei Wuxian. He's not trying to escape. Sewujun, get away from him, he shouted. It was already too late. Blood from Jing Guangyao's severed limb had dripped onto the coffin. It crawled over Wei Wuxian's drawings, ruining the spell and flowing beneath the lid and into the coffin itself. Ni Ming Zhu burst through the coffin's seal. This dead man will not stay down. The coffin lid shattered to pieces. One large, ghastly pale hand seized Jing Guangyao by the neck, and the other hand reached for Lan Shi Chen's throat. Jing Guangyao wasn't trying to escape. With his last breath, he was trying to draw Lan Shi Chen to Niming Zhu so they could perish together. Lan Wujie no, this is really the moment. One, one sixteen. Page one sixteen is the moment where you realize how fucked up. 
Lan Wangji summoned Bi Chen with lightning speed, and it shot forth in their direction. But Ni Mingzhu had no fear of such spiritual weapons. Even if Bi Chen struck him, it likely couldn't stop him from closing the minuscule distance between his hand and Lan Chi Chen's neck. And yet, just when Ni Mingzhu's hand was mere millimeters from its target, Jing Guangyao used his remaining left hand to shove Lan Chi Chen's chest, pushing him out of reach of Ni Mingzhu's grasp. In the same moment, Ni Mingzhu dragged Jing Guangyao into the coffin by the neck, then raised him to dangle like a rag doll. It was a horrifying tableau. Jing Guangyao was clawing at Ni Mingzhu's iron-like, iron-like grip, struggling and writhing from the pain. Ferocity flashed in his eyes as he fought, his hair loose and wild. With all he had, he yelled, Ni Mingzhu, you motherfucker! You think I'm actually afraid of you? I... With difficulty, he choked out a mouthful of blood. Everyone present heard an unusually cruel, loud crack. A gagged whimper escaped Jin Guangyao's throat. Jin Ling's shoulders shuddered. He shut his eyes, covered his ears, afraid to listen or look any longer. The push had sent Lan Shi Chen staggering back several steps. He had yet to realize what had happened during that split second. Lan Wang Ji, on the other hand, smacked the back of the beautiful Guan Yin statue. The impact shook the statue and sent it flying toward Ni Ming Zhu, who was still scrutinizing the crooked neck ooh, the crooked necked corpse in his hands. The heavy Guan Yin statue struck him so hard that he tumbled that he toppled back into the coffin. Hey, we should really keep a counter of Ni Ming Zhu out of the coffin, in the coffin, out of the coffin, in the coffin. Wei Wuxian leaped up and stood on the Guan Yin statue's chest. The lid of the coffin had been cracked, so he had to use the statue in its place to seal the berserk Ni Ming Zhu, who struck the statue again and again with his palm in his attempts to get out from underneath. Wei Wuxian wobbled and swayed unsteadily with each strike, almost thrown off. After teetering a few times, he realized there was no way he could draw a spell like this. Lan Jun, quick, come up here with me so we have another person's weight. A few more blows and this Guan Yin statue is going to fall apart. Before he could finish, Wei Wuxian suddenly felt his body and line of sight slant. Lan Wang Ji had grabbed one end of the coffin and lifted it. More specifically, he had raised the heavy, solid wood coffin off the floor using only his left hand, a coffin with two dead people inside, and a Guan Yin statue and Wei Wuxian on top. Wei Wuxian's jaw dropped. Even if he had long known that Lan Wangji had astoundingly strong arms, this was still <laughs> flabbergasting beyond belief. Lan Wangji's expression remained unchanged as he brandished a silver kuchin string. The string whirled itself around the coffin and the Guan Yin statue dozens of times, firmly binding both together. A second and third string followed. Once he determined that Ni Ming Zhu and Jing Guang Yao had been securely sealed off, he hastily released his grip on one end of the coffin. That end crashed to the ground with a thunderous noise. Wei Bu Shen tilted with it, and Lan Wangji caught him just got him before steadily setting him on the ground. The same hands that had just grappled with such a hefty weight held Wei Wuxian with the utmost gentleness. <sighs> just a fucking moment, okay? Lan Shi Chen stared blankly at the coffin, which had been bound and sealed with seven Guchin strings. He was still out of sorts. Ni Huasong reached out a hand and waved it in front of him. Shi Chen Ga, he called out, terrified. Are you okay? Huasong, Lan Shi Chen began. Was he really trying to sneak up on me earlier? I think so, Ni Huasong said. Hearing him stammer, Lan Shi Chen pressed him. Think about it again. Carefully. I can't be sure when you ask me like that, Ni Huasong said. It really did look like it. Stop dithering, Lan Chi Chen snapped. Was he or was he not? Put on the spot, Ni Huasong said. I don't know. I really don't know. 
whenever Ni Huasang was pushed into a corner, he would only repeat that phrase. Lan Chi Chen buried his head in his hands, looking like he had looking like he had a splitting headache and did not want to speak any further. Huasang Xiong, Wei Wu Shan suddenly piped up. Huh, Ni Huasang said. How did Su Shen manage to stab you earlier? He was fleeing with Sangha, Ni Huasang corrected himself, with Sekliru Jin on his back. And I was in his way, so... Really? Wei Wu Shan questioned. As I recall, the spot where you stood wasn't in the path of their escape at all. Would I seriously have bumped into him to get stabbed on purpose, Ni Huasang said? Wei Wu Shan smiled. I didn't say that. Then what are you saying? Then what are you trying to say, Wei Xiong? Ni Huasang asked. It's just that I've suddenly pieced together a few things, Wei Wu Shan said. What things? Ni Huasang asked. Jing Guang Yao said that someone sent him a letter, threatening to tell the world about everything he had done once seven days had passed, Wei Wu Shan said. If we assume he was telling the truth, that he wasn't lying, the letter writer was doing something unnecessary. If you wanted to expose someone's crimes, why not just expose them outright? Why make a point of notifying them that you had evidence of their guilt in your hands? But didn't Sangha, didn't Sec Leader Jin say that the letter writer wanted to make wanted him to make the decision to confess and apologize for his crimes? Please wake up, Wei Wu Shan said. You don't have to be a genius to know that Jing Guang Yao would never choose to confess or apologize. But would a person capable of digging up all of Jing Guang Yao's dirty little secrets do something so pointless? There must have been a reason for that apparently needless act. They wanted to make something happen. They wanted the letter to provoke something. Provoke? Lan Shi Chen asked blankly. Provoke what? Jing Wang Yao's intent to kill, Lan Wang Ji replied in a low voice. Zhe Wu Jun would have, realized, uh, would have realized this as well if he had been his usual self, but he was likely too preoccupied to consider the possibility right now. That's right, Wei Wuxian said. It was the letter that catapulted Jing Guang Yao's killing intent to an unprecedented level. Didn't it say he should wait for death to claim him in seven days? If that was the case, he'd make the first move within those seven days. He'd wipe out the main forces of the other clans at the burial mounds and see who'd be the one to die first. You are saying that was what the letter... Mm. You are saying that was what the letter writer wanted? Lan Shi Chen wondered. It was all to spur him into taking action? That's what I think, Wei Wuxian answered. Lan Shi Chen shook his head. Then what was the letter writer trying to accomplish? What were they trying were they trying to expose Jing Guang Yao, massacre the other the other clans? It's simple, Wei Wuxian said. Look at what happened after the siege failed. Cici and Basao came calling at Lotus Pier, where everyone was assembled and emotions were running high. I don't think the arrival of those two witnesses was a coincidence. Things kept building up until they came to a head. After a pause, he continued, the letter writer didn't just want Jing Guang Yao to lose his standing and fall from grace, they also wanted him to become public enemy number one. And it all had to happen in one single critical hit. There could be absolutely no room for Jing Guang Yao to return to turn the tide in his favor. Sounds like they've been plotting for a long time, Ni Huasong commented. Wei Wuxian looked at him, then suddenly asked a question. Oh, right. Wasn't Chi Feng Jun's body left with Sec Leader Ni for safekeeping? It was in my custody at first, Ni Huasang replied. But I received news that my Dage's body had disappeared from Qing'e without a chase. Why else, would I th why else do you think I was rushing home? I even wound up being kidnapped by Su She on the way. Sec Leader Ni... I heard you often travel between the Lan clan of Gusu and the Jing clan of Lan Ling. Is that true? Wei Wuxian asked. Yeah, Ni Huasang answered. Then do you really not know Mo Shan Yu? Huh? I remember the first time I met you after the sacrificial ritual succeeded. Wei Wuxian said. You acted like you didn't know me at all. You even asked Hang Wan Jun who I was. Mo Shan Yu had pestered Jing Guang Yao a great deal in the past, and was even able to access the manuscripts in his collection, and you often went looking for Sec Leader Jin to pour out your woes. You might not have been well acquainted with Mo Xuanyu, but have you really never, e never even seen him once? Ni Huasang scratched his head. Wei Xiang, 
Golden Carp Tower is so big, I couldn't possibly have met everyone there. And even if I had, I couldn't possibly remember them all. Besides, he looked somewhat embarrassed as he continued. You know what Mo Shuan Yu is like. He was a little... The Jun clan of Lan Ling did the best they could to hide him away. It isn't so strange that I'd never seen him before. Even Shi Chenga might not have met him. Oh, that's true, Wei Wushan said. Wei Wushan didn't know Mo, Mo Shuan Yu either. Right? Ni Hua Sung exclaimed. And there's one thing I don't understand. Even if I had seen Mo Shuan Yu before, why would I de deliberately pretend to not know him? Why would I need to do that? Wei Wuxian smiled. It's nothing. I just found it strange and wanted to ask. <sighs> Inwardly, he said, to probe if this Mo Shan Yu was the real Mo Shan Yu, of course. How would Mo Shan Yu, who was said to be timid and weak-willed, have had the courage to offer up his body through suicide? Why would Shi Feng Jin's left arm have been tossed out into the world? Could Jun Guang Yao have let it escape due to an oversight? And why did it just so happen to show up at a at Mo Manor, where the sacrificial ritual had been carried out, and where a newly and where a newly reborn Wei Wuxian could encounter it? Chi Feng Jun's corpse had been laid to rest by the Ni Clan of Qing He. Had Ni Huasong, who always respected his elder brother, really not really not noticed the corpse that had been swapped for all those years. Thus, Wei Wuxian was more inclined to believe in the following scenario. Perhaps Ni Huasong had really been a head shaker from, uh, before Ni Mingzhu's passing. After Ni Mingzhu's death, however, he went from knowing nothing to knowing everything, including the fact that Ni Mingzhu's corpse had been swapped and the true colors of the Sangha he had once trusted. He had attempted to find his elder's body, but after many years of hardship, all he could find was Ni Mingzhu's left arm. He had been struck, unable to find any clues to guide him to the next step. What's more, the left arm was unusually ferocious and difficult to subdue. Keeping it by his side would only lead to more bloodshed. And then someone came to mind. A person who was most adept in dealing with these kinds of creatures and these kinds of problems. The Yiling Patriarch. But the Yiling Patriarch had been torn to shreds. What was he to do? So yet another person came to mind. Mo Xuan Yu, who had been banished from the Golden Carp Tower. In the past, Ni Huasong might have chatted with Mo Xuan Yu to glean information from him, from the mouth of the dejected Mo Xuan Yu. Ni Huasong had learned that he'd read one of Jin Guangyao's fragmented manuscripts of forbidden magic, in which an ancient evil ritual was recorded. He had then incited Mo Xuan Yu to exact revenge for the humiliation he'd suffered at the hands of his own clan members to use the forbidden art of the sacrificial ritual to seek retribution. And which malicious ghost should he invite in? The Yiling Patriarch, of course! Ah! Unable to bear living any longer, Mo Xuan Yu had finally activated the blood array, and Ni Huasong had seized the opportunity to toss out the hot potato he could barely hold on to to begin with. Chi Feng Jun's left arm. The plan was moved forward successfully after that. He no longer needed to go to the trouble of personally seeking Ni Ming Ju's remaining limbs. Instead, he left everything dangerous or complicated to Wei Wuxian and Lin Wang Ji, needing only to keep a close watch on their movements. The strange incidents involving murdered cats that Jinling, Lan Shijui, Lan Jingyi, and the other juniors had encountered on their journey had clearly been the work of someone deliberately staging bizarre phenomena. Coupled with the non-existent huntsman at the nearby village who had given them directions, there was no doubt that the intent had been that the intent had been to lure the naive juniors into Yi City. After all, if Wei Wuxian and Lang Wangji had slipped up and failed to protect them, Jing Guangyao would likely be blamed for anything untoward that befell the juniors there. In any case, the more chips there were in play to convict Jing Guangyao of his crimes, the better. The more mistakes he could tempt this prudent villain to make, the better the evidence to use against him, the more tragic the fate that befell him, the better. Lang Wangji used the tip of the beach hen to run over to the run over the black chest beside the coffin and glanced at the spell engraved on it. The head, he said to Wei Wuxian. The chest had lightly been used 
The chest had likely been used to contain Li Mingzhu's head. Jing Wangyao had probably buried it here after transferring it out of Golden Carp Tower. Wei Wuxian nodded to him. Sekli Ni, do you know what was originally contained in this coffin? How, how would I know? Ni Huasong answered. But given Sangha, uh, no, how, how Sekli Jin looked, I guess it was probably something very important to him. Coffins are, of course, used to, the, used to house the dead, Wei Wuxian said. My guess is that the corpse that was buried here was Jin Guangyao's mother, Meng Shui. He came here tonight to retrieve her body and take it with him as he escaped to Dong Ying. Lan Chi Chen was stunned speechless. Oh yeah, that makes sense, Ni Huasong exclaimed aloud as understanding dawned on him. What do you think they'll do with his mother's body now that they've dug it up? Wei Wuxian asked. Wei Xiong, why do you keep asking me? Ni Huasong said. I don't know, that's not going to change no matter how many times you ask. After he paused, he added, However, Ni Huasong slowly gathered up his, up his hair, which had been drenched by the rainstorm. Since they hate Jing Guangya so much, they'd probably be extraordinarily ruthless with something he valued as dearly as his own life, right? For example, dismembering the corpse and discarding the pieces in various places, just like what was done to Chi Feng Jun, Wei Wuxian, Wei Wuxian asked. Greatly shocked, Ni Huasong took a few steps back. That, that's much too vicious. Wei Wuxian stared at him for a while, but eventually averted his gaze. Conjecture was only conjecture, after all. None of them had evidence. Perhaps the blank, helpless expression on Ni Huasong's face was a mask. He could be reluctant to admit that he treated others as his pawns, placed no val value on their lives, or maybe there was more to his plan, and he wanted to keep concealing his true colors so he could hatch more schemes, achieve greater goals. Or maybe it wasn't that complicated at all. Maybe it was someone else who had delivered their intention to who had delivered the letter, killed the cats, and sued Ni Mingju's head and body together. Maybe Ni Huasong was simply a bona fide good for nothing. Maybe the last words Jing Guangyao had said were merely lies he devised after Ni Huasong cried out and exposed his attempt to launch a sneak attack, all for the sake of throwing Lan Chen's mind, in, mind into turmoil so that Jing Guangyao could seize the opportunity to perish with him at his side. After all, Jing Guangyao was a professional liar and notorious for his misdeeds. No matter when he lied or what he lied about, it would come as no surprise. As for why he had changed his mind at the last second and shoved Lan Chi Chen away, who could ever know what he was really thinking? Veins bulged on the back of his hand while mm. Veins bulged on the back of the hand with which Lan Chi Chen clutched his head. What did he want? he murmured. I used to think I knew him very well. Later I realized I did not. Before tonight, I thought I had renewed my understanding of him, but now I once again find myself at a loss. No one could give him an answer. Lan Chi Chen repeated, what exactly did he want? Lan Chi Chen was the one who had been closest to Jing Wang Yao. If he, did not, if he did not know, the others were even less likely to. After a moment of silence, Wei Wuxian said, Let's stop standing around doing nothing. We'll pick a few people to go fetch help, and the rest will stay here to watch this thing. Those Guchin strings won't be able to keep Chu Feng Jun in the coffin for long. As if to confirm his assessment, a wave of thunderous noise sounded from inside the coffin, indicating a nameless fury. Ni Wasong shuddered. Wei Wuxian cast a glance at him. See? You have to replace it immediately with an even more secure... With with an even more secure and solid coffin, and rebury it in a deep pit where it cannot be unearthed for at least a century. <sighs> if it is opened, I guarantee the evil will persist with, with endless trouble to follow. He had yet to finish his sentence when a clear, resounding bark rang out in the distance. Wei Wuxian suppressed... Wei Wuxian's expression changed at once, but Jin Ling managed to perk up a little. Fairy! The claps of thunder had died down and the downpour had dwindled to a drizzle. Ooh. Once again, alliteration. 
The darkest hours of the night had already passed, and the dawn was breaking. The soaking, wet, black-haired spirit dog pumped its legs as it dashed toward them like a gust of black wind. It pounced at Jin Ling and clung to its master's legs while standing on its hind limbs, whispering, all, whimpering all the while. Its round, doggy eyes were damp. <clears throat> Wei Wushan saw its long red tongue flick out from behind its sharp snow-white fangs to lick Jin Ling's hand, and his face blanched equally white. Eyes blank and mouth agape, he felt as if his soul was about to turn into a wisp of smoke and take leave of this body to ascend to the heavens. Lan Wangji silently stood in front of him to shield him and block his view of fairy. A moment later, hundreds of people surrounded the Guanyin Temple. Each wore a vigilant expression, swords drawn as if ready to start killing at a moment notice. At any moment. But when those... But when those leading the charge into the, into the temple got a clear look at the scene before them, they were stunned. There were dead bodies sprawled out everywhere, the eye, everywhere the eye could see, and anyone who wasn't dead could barely stand upright. The temple grounds were littered with corpses and wreckage, to put it fucking mildly. Two people had led the charge, swords at the ready. The one on the left was the Jang clan of Yun Meng's chief of, chief of affairs, while the one on the right was, astonishingly, Lan Chi Ren. Surprise and, be and bewilderment were written on his face. Before he could open his mouth to ask questions, the first thing he saw was Lan Wang Ji stuck so close to Wei Bu Shan that they were almost one person. In that instant, he forgot he had anything to say. Fury washed over his face. His brows knitted. The chicken... Woo. Hang on. I... My brain just had a whole ass train wreck. Let's back up and try that again. In that instant, he forgot everything he had to say. Fury washed over his face. His long brows knitted and his indignant huffing sent his beard quivering and bristling. The chief of affairs hurried forward to support Zheng Chung. Sect leader, are you all right? Lan Chiren raised his sword and bellowed, What? He was cut off by several figures in white who rushed out from behind him, yelling, Heng Wanjun, Wei Chen Bei, Patriarch Chen Bei. The last boy bumped into Lan Chiren, almost causing him to fall over. Smoking with anger from his seven apertures, he barked, No hurried walking, no clamoring. Other than Lan Wangji, who greeted him with Shufu, no one else paid him any mind. Lan Shijui grabbed Lan Wangji's sleeve with one hand and Wei Bushan's arm with the other. This is great! Hang Wanjun, Wei Chenbei, your brother Kei! He said with delight. We saw how anxious Fairy was and thought you might be in a tricky situation. Shijui, are you confused or something? Lan Jingyi said. How could there ever be a situation Hang Wanju can't resolve? I told you not to worry for nothing. Jing Yi, wasn't it you who was worrying for nothing on the way here? Go away, you don't blabber nonsense. Lan Shijui spotted Wen Ning, who had finally managed to crawl upright out of the corner of his eye. He immediately grabbed him and pulled him into the circle of boys who all began to talk over each other to recount what had happened. After Fairy had bit Suchet, it had run until it found a clan affiliated with the Jang clan of Yang Meng that was stationed near the town. It had barked furiously at their door to sound the alarm. The junior head of the family had seen the special collar around its neck, marked with a golden motif, family crest, and other such things, and had immediately determined that this was a spirit dog of significance with a distinguished owner. Then he noticed the blood on its claws and fur. The dog had clearly been in a fight, most likely because its owner was in danger. Not daring to dismiss the urgency of the situation, the man immediately took the dog and rode to Lotus Pier on his sword to notify the region's real boss, the Jang clan of Young Meng. The chief of affairs instantly recognized it as Fairy, the spirit dog belonging to the little young master Jin Ling, and promptly sent reinforcements. The cultivators of the land clan of Gusu had been about to leave Lotus Pier right around then, but Fairy stopped Lan Chi Ren. It had leapt up and torn a thin strip of white fabric from the hem of Lan Shijui's robes, then pulled it over its head with its paws, 
like it was trying to wrap it around its head. Then it lay down and played dead. Lan Chi Ren had been baffled, but Lan Chi Jui had a sudden flash of insight. Shen Chang, does it not look like it's imitating our clan, our clan's forehead ribbon? Is it trying to tell us that Hang Wang Jun or another member of the Lan Clan is in danger? What is it, Lassie? Lan Jen stuck in a well? And so the Jain Clan of Yan Meng, the Lan Clan of Gusu, and several other clans that had yet to leave Lotus Pier had all gathered their manpower and come here together to render assistance. Lan Jing Yi clicked his tongue. We keep calling it fairy, fairy, but who would have thought it was, it really is a spirit dog, he praised in a wondering tone. But no matter how spiritual or intelligent it might be, as far as Wei Wuxian was concerned, it was still a dog, the scariest creature in the world. Even with Lan Wang Ji standing in front of him, goosebumps spread all over his body. Ever since the juniors from the Lan Clan came in, Jin Ling had been stealing glances in their direction, watching them clamor around Wei Wuxian and Lan Wang Ji. Seeing the color gradually leave Wei Wuxian's face, he patted Fairy on the butt and whispered, Fairy, go outside. Fairy wagged its tail and continued to lick him. Go out, or are you disobeying me? Jin Ling chided. Fairy threw him a plaintive look, then obediently darted out of the temple with its tail wagging. Only then did Wei Wuxian heave a sigh of relief. Jin Ling wanted to go over, but embarrassment held him back. As he continued to hesitate, Lan Shijui suddenly saw something hanging at Wei Wuxian's waist. His entire body froze for a moment. Froze for a moment. Wei Chenbei? Hmm? What? Wei Wuxian asked. Lan Shijui sounded like he was in a daze as he asked, Can, can I take a look at your flute? Wei Wuxian grabbed it and offered it to him. Something wrong with it? Lan Shijui took the flute with both hands and frowned slightly, looking a little perplexed. Lan Wangji watched him while Wei Wuxian looked at Lan Wangji. What's with your clan sh What's with your clan Shijui? Does he like my flute? Huh? You finally discarded that lousy attitude flute of yours? Lan Jingyi blurted in surprise. This new flute looks pretty decent. He didn't know that this decent new flute was the very spiritual weapon he'd always been dying to catch a glimpse of, the legendary hell flute, Chen Cheng. He merely thought to himself with glee, this is great, at least now when he and Hang Wang Jun play duets, he won't look as much of a disgrace as he used to. Good God, that old flute was really ugly and horrible sounding. Shijui, Lan Wang Ji called out. Only then did Lan Shijui snap back to his senses. He returned Chen Cheng to Wei Wuxian with both hands. Wei Chenbei. Wei Wuxian took the flute, then remembered Jiang Cheng was the one who had brought it here. He turned to Jiang Cheng. Thanks, Wei Wuxian casually said, then raised Chen Cheng. I'll keep this then. Jiang Cheng glanced at him. It was yours to begin with. After a moment of hesitation, his lips moved slightly, as if he still had something to say. But Wei Wuxian had already turned back to Lan Wangji, and seeing this, Jiang Cheng fell silent and said nothing else. Some of the people present were cleaning up the scene, some were reinforcing the seal on the coffin, and some were discussing how to transport it safely. Some, however, were angry. Shi Chen, what on earth is wrong with you? Lan Chi Ren fumed. Lan Chi Chen pressed his temple, face heavy with unspeakable melancholy. Shufu, please, I beg you, stop asking. He answered with audible weariness. I really do not wish to speak right now. Lan Chi Ren had raised Lan Chi Chen single-handedly, and he had never seen him look so agitated and, re and restless. So undignified and unbecoming. He looked at him, then at Lan Wang Ji, who stood with Wei Wuxian, surrounded by the juniors. Just two dads and their babies. The more he looked, the more he fumed. Neither of these two previously flawless pupils would heed him anymore. Both were now sources of worry. The coffin that held Li Mingzhu and Jing Guangyao wasn't just abnormally heavy, but also had to be treated with the utmost care. As such, several family heads volunteered to transport it. One of those family heads saw the face of the Guanyin statue. He was taken aback at first, then directed the others to look at it too, as if he'd discovered something novel. Look at its face. Doesn't it look like, doesn't it look like Jingguang Yao? 
When the others saw it, they clicked their tongues in wonder. It really is his face. Why would Jing Guang Yao make such a thing? To arrogantly proclaim himself God, I wager, Sect Leader Yao stated. That is so very ignorant. But not necessarily, Wei Wuxian thought. Everyone regarded Jing Guang Yao's mother as the lowliest of prostitutes. And so, he had insisted on carving this Guan Yin statue in the likeness of his mother so she would be worshipped by millions, by millions of people who would kowtow to her and offer her incense. But there was no point in saying any of that now. Wei Wuxian knew better than anyone that nobody would believe it or care. Anything involving Jing Guang Yao would be met with only the most with only the most malicious of speculation, and gossip would spread that speculation across the land, like gossip is wont to fucking do. Not long after, the coffin would be sealed within an even larger and more secure one, then nailed shut with 72 peachwood pegs and buried deep beneath some mountain to keep its, its evil suppressed. And there it would remain, accompanied by a stone tablet to warn passersby, of the danger. And those sealed within would also remain confined for eternity, reviled by all, never to be absolved. Ni Huasang leaned against the doorframe and watched as several heads of families lifted the, co lifted the coffin across the threshold of the Guanyin Temple. He lowered his head and patted the dirt from the front of his robes. He paused for a moment as though he had seen something. Wei Wuxian looked over as well. There was something left behind on the ground. It was Jin Guang Yao's cap. Ni Huasong bent to pick it up before strolling out the door. Hmm. Fairy barked a few times as it waited anxiously for its master outside. Hearing it, Jin Ling suddenly remembered that Jin Guang Yao had been the one who had given him Fairy when it was still a clumsy puppy that didn't even reach his knees. Jin Ling had only been so old at the time. He just had a fight with the with the older children in Golden Carp Tower, and though he'd won, he didn't find it gratifying at all. He had been in a frenzy, smashing things in his room and wailing at the top of his lungs. No major servants had dared to get close to him for fear they would be hit by flying objects. But his little uncle had been all smiles when he poked it, his head into his room to ask them, Ah Ling, what's wrong? Jin Ling had immediately smashed five or six vases at Jing Guang Yao's feet. Oh, goodness, so fierce. How scary, Jing Guang Yao had replied. Then he had left, shaking his head and looking terribly sad, scared. Jin Ling had still been in a huff when the next day came, refusing to leave his room or eat. Jing Guang Yao had hung around the entrance to his chamber. Bracing his back against the door, Jin Ling had only just yelled, Leave me alone! when a puppy's barks suddenly ran out. He had opened the door only to see Jing Guang Yao crouching there, holding in his arms a tiny black-haired puppy with round, shining eyes. Jing Guang Yao had looked up and smiled at him. I found this little thing, but I don't know what to call it. Ah Ling, do you want to give it a name? That smile had been so gentle and sincere that Jin Ling refused to believe Jing Guang Yao had been faking it. All of a sudden, tears trembled from his eyes once more. Jin Ling had always thought that crying was a sign of weakness and incompetence, and scoffed at such behavior. But right now, he had no way to release the anguish and indignation in his heart other than shedding an ocean of tears. <sighs> Somehow, there didn't seem to be anyone he could blame, or, an, or anyone he could hate. Wei Bishan, Jing Guang Yao, Wen Ning, he should hold every one of them responsible for his parents' deaths. He had good reason to loathe each of them, but they all seemed like they had had their reasons, and it left him unable to hate them. Oh, like one of the core, one of the core facets of this entire, this entire book, this entire series. That exactly. Page 134 towards the bottom. That is one of the points, TM, of this work. But if he didn't hate them, who could he hate? Had he deserved to lose both parents at such a young age? 
Was this how he would be forced to live, unable to seek revenge on his enemies, but also unable to loathe them without qualms? He couldn't take this lying down. He couldn't help but feel aggrieved. How he yearned to perish with them and be done with it. Sec leader Yao saw him staring at the coffin, crying soundlessly. Jin Xiao Gongji, why are you crying? Are you crying over Jin Guang Yao? When Jin Ling was silent, Sec leader Yao began to chide him in a tone that elders used to reprove their own ju juniors. Why are you crying? Stop those tears. A man like your uncle is not worth crying for. Xiao Gongji, pardon me for saying this, but you can't be so weak. This is the soft-heartedness of a woman. You must know what is right and what is wrong. You should correct your... And they couldn't finish because everybody around them just fucking puked. When the Jing clan of Lan Ling's family head had still been the cultivation chief who oversaw all the clans, the other family heads would have never dared assume the air of an elder and lecture a Jin the heir of an elder and lecture a Jin clan junior. But Jin Guangyao was now dead, and there was no one in the Jin clan of Lan Ling who could take his mantle. The Jin clan's reputation was more or less ruined. They would likely never rise to the top again. And so those who dared posture had already begun to come out of the woodwork. Jin Ling was drowning in a sea of thoughts and emotions. Fury welled up within him to hear Sec Leader Yao rambling about his personal judgment on the matter while gesticulating here and there. So what if I want to cry, he hollered. Who are you? Who do you think you are? What do you care if I cry? Sec Leader Yao had clearly not expected this lecture to be so thoroughly rebuffed, nor that he'd wind up being the one getting yelled at. He promptly pulled a long face. Forget it, the others advised him in hushed tones. Don't, bo don't bother yourself with children. Only then was he able to rein in his rage at being humiliated. He snorted coldly. That's for sure. And why bother with a brat who's still wet behind the ears and can't tell right from wrong, or good from evil? Len Chiren watched over the coffin as it was transported onto the wagon. He looked back and was dumbfounded. Where's Wang Ji? he asked. He'd been planning to haul Lan Wang Ji back to the cloud recesses and have a long heart-to-heart -heart talk with him for a hundred and twenty days. Should that fail, he'd confine him again for a while. Who could have imagined Lan Wang Ji would vanish in the blink of an eye? He circled the place a few times and raised his voice. Where's Wang Ji? Lan Jing Yi spoke up. Uh, earlier, I said we'd brought little apple with us and tethered it outside the temple, so Hang Wenjun took, took to see little apple together. And then, Lan Chiren demanded, what happened next was a foregone conclusion. There wasn't even a hint of Wei Wuxian, Lan Wangji, or Wen Ning's shadows to be seen outside the Guanyin Temple. Lan Chiren looked at Lan Chi Chen, who lagged absentmindedly behind him, then heaved a heavy sigh and left with a flick of his sleeves. Lan Jingyi looked around and looked around and exclaimed in surprise, Shijui, what's going on? When did Shijui disappear too? When Jin Ling heard Wei Wuxian and Lan Wangji were gone, he dashed outside in a hurry, nearly tripping over the threshold of the Guanyin Temple in the process. But no matter how urgently he rushed, he couldn't even catch their shadows. Fairy happily circled around him, its tongue lolling as it panted. Zheng Cheng was standing under a towering tree on the, on the Guanyin Temple grounds. He glanced at him and said coldly, Wipe your face. Jin Ling rubbed his eyes hard and wiped his face. Running over to Jeng Cheng, he asked, Where are they? Gone, Jeng Cheng replied. And you just let them go? Jin Ling blurted. What else was I supposed to do? Jeng Cheng asked mockingly. Keep them for dinner, say thank you, and then sorry? Agitated, Jin Ling pointed at him. No wonder he wanted to leave. It's all because you're like this. Juju, why are you so annoying? Jang Chen glared at him angrily, raising his hand as he scolded. Is that how you speak to your elders? You're asking for a beating. Jin Ling flinched back and Fairy tucked its tail between its legs. Jang Chen's slap never did land on the back of Jin Ling's head. Instead, he weakly withdrew his hand. Shut up, Jin Ling. Just shut up, he said, irritated. Let's go back. Everyone will return to their respective places. Jin Ling was taken aback. After a moment of hesitation, he did as he was told and shut his mouth. With his head drooping, he walked shoulder to shoulder with Jang Chung for a few steps 
before he looked up again. Juju, were you going to say something earlier? What? Zheng Cheng said. No. Uh, just now, Jin Ling persisted. I saw it. You were going to say something to Wei Wuxian, but you didn't. After a long silence, Zheng Cheng shook his head. There's nothing to say. What was there to say? Perhaps there was this. I didn't get caught by the Wen clan because I insisted on returning to Lotus Pier to retrieve my parents' bodies. When you went to buy rations in that small town during our escape, a group of Wen cultivators caught up to us. I noticed them early and left the spot where I'd been sitting to hide in the corner of the street. I didn't get caught, but they were patrolling, and they would have surely bumped into you while you were getting us food. So I ran out and lured them away. But just as the Wei Wuxian of the past, who had extracted his golden core for Zheng Cheng, had been unable to tell him the truth, the Zheng Cheng of the present could no longer bring himself to speak up. <sighs> That's it for the chapter. The next cha- oh my god. Chapter 23, on page 139, is called Wang Xian, Forgetting Envy. But we're gonna have to read that next time. What a lovely note to end on that's not at all emotionally destroying. I will see you in a couple of days. Thank you so much for watching, and please remember to take care of yourself.